I just hit the record button and I'll get into this. So welcome into now our week nine. We've got four more weeks after this. So Katina, these are OUA students and some Hawthorne online. So again, all around Australia, a couple around the world. Uh, this is professional issues in IT, a final year, normally a final semester unit. Um, but you're quite aware of that. Um, we've had many, many conversations about the topics that we cover and um, I sent you through the details of what we've covered so far. And we've introduced PIT, not to be confused with PIT, that's our unit, but we've introduced PIT last semester because we thought it was sort of a good bookend to the investigative case study to get us refocused for the final push through in the next couple of weeks, looking at the diversity inclusion, mental health, upgrade your world sort of things. The bigger picture idea of what are we maybe responsible for? What are the implied obligations of being a professional in ICT? So everybody who's here physically or virtually and listening in, um, extra special guest, um, Professor Katina Michael at Arizona State University, but not physically there, are you? No, still down in the South Coast, beautiful place called Gerangong. So we've got a couple of New South Wales people in the unit. They probably know um, that sort of beautiful part of, of the world. So that's where Katina is physically. But um, I'll just show one slide and then I'll let you, Katina, tell us who you are and um, what you're doing and um, nobody better than the expert. But for everybody, I, this is maybe 20 years ago, maybe 20 and a half years ago. When I remember the, the, the story around this, I'd imagined I was four rows back in the corner because that's where the door was, just under that stairway and you could escape. And I think, Kat, this was a fourth year unit. This was like IAC yeah. 40 something or other. 406. Right? So this is like, it's not an honours year, but it's an advanced unit, um, an e-business something or other, um, which was really um, the zeitgeist at the time, if we think back sort of the year 2000 or 2001. Stewie um, Simons is about to come in a couple of seconds after this and sit right next to me. And my words after Katina says her introductory remarks that she's left a six figure salary and she really wants to teach. I turned to Stewie and I said, we've heard all this yes before. <laughs> and <laughs> so wrong have I ever been in my life um, to now inviting my younger but wiser sister into the Collaborate Ultra. And if you're thinking this is very sort of, you know, family orientated and narcissistic, she's not my actual blood sister. It's just a mother by it. Um, another mum. It's Katina and I. Before I quickly pass off to you, Katina, next week we've got um, a podcast with Jemana and Lisa. So we're using the Empathy Live from Istas last year. I haven't told Jemana that just in case she's going to get me for royalties or something, I've got to send a check across to New York. <laughs> and in week four, we actually had tamers um, traveling while Arab, looking at the privacy issues that we could pull out of that. Um, so everybody, Katina is, what's the word, maybe a conduit <laughs> into these other realms, these other people, amazing people around the world. And then in week 12, Kanjan is going to pop up, not in person, because I think he's in Pakistan or about to, to go to Pakistan. But we're going to learn from him. So Katina has introduced me into all of those amazing individuals. Okay, we're recording. Over to you, Katina. If you could say who you are, why you're here, and then just let us know what this thing of pit is. You know, who cares? Why is it so important? And maybe what are the touch points that us, us as ICT professionals um, are going to have with this concept, which you know, us in the Southern Hemisphere didn't really know what it was. We were probably doing it, but we've sort of latched on down here at Swinburne in particular with with um, Pitt. So over to you. Thank you, Jason. I had somebody uh, asking me uh, two weeks ago whether we were actually brother and sister. I haven't told you that story yet because I referred to you as uh, my big brother. And... Uh, I said, yeah, he, he is my brother, just not biologically. And today we are going to touch on communities of practice. 
But if you wanted to um, think for a moment, what is a community? And I grew up in the Greek Australian ethnic community in Sydney, right next to the airport in New South Wales, Sydney airport. Um, we could walk to the airport. And I understood community firsthand because uh, I was brought up probably more Greek than the Greeks. And for those of you in Victoria, you know what I'm talking about. Um, you just have to travel down some of the eateries when you're not in lockdown. I didn't really understand the importance of my parents' emphasis on culture. I took it for granted. And as I've matured into my 40s, have I only recognised the incredible job they did in helping us to feel comfortable in our own skin. And so I went to Tempe Primary Disadvantage School. That's what it was called when I went there. It's now been transformed into what's called, you know, Tempe High School Language School, because there were over 150 languages represented in the year groups uh, when I was there in grade eight. I left uh, shortly afterwards. But my parents would take us weekly to community events. And there were no mobile phones back then. So everything was very much word of mouth. If you were lucky to afford a, a landline, you would uh, find out about the next event or somebody would say to you, you don't have a car, you know, uh, we've organized to pick you up. But the events were not like glitzy events. You know, we didn't have to spend money. Everyone would prepare food at home. And communally, we'd go to parks, beaches in the summer, picnics, uh, dances, uh, hear Greek music, celebrate uh, our traditions. Some of that was church life, for example, Easter, and other ritualistic things, but also beyond the ritual, uh, the meaning behind things. And uh, when I landed myself in, at Arizona State University, our president, Michael Crow, like the vice chancellor in the Australian setting, invited all the new professors to a round table. It was actually a luncheon and it was a glitzy luncheon, but in inside the, the campus. So a dedicated presidential room where all the professors gathered and I was surrounded by people talking about their amazingness, to be honest with you. Uh, President Crow asked us which university we had studied at, where we got our PhD, where we were coming from. And I was surrounded by people from Harvard, from Oxford, from Stanford, and the list goes on. But all of these people had something in common because Arizona State University is a state university that prides itself on opening the doors to as many American based students in state and out of state as it's called and internationally as possible and to make in the US setting education affordable. One of the biggest problems in America is that over a third of people who enter college or university drop out in their first or second year. And that could be from different reasons, affordability, um, health issues, uh, employment issues and support issues, housing, etc. So there's a huge emphasis at Arizona State University on the social issues and the environmental issues. And these social issues and environmental issues are linked. So at this round table, President Crow says, you know, and how many of you are first in family to, to, to matriculate? And I didn't put up my hand because the way my parents brought me up is that you can do anything. It doesn't matter what labels people stick on you. It doesn't matter how you look, doesn't matter what you speak. It doesn't matter what you believe. My parents always said the I can't is the blocking point. So the I can became a motto in my household. It still was. When I said to my mother, who's now in her 70s, uh, you know, I've got this job offer in the States. This was about three and a half, four years ago now. Uh, what should I do? You know, I don't think I want to leave you all. She looks at me and says, well, why can't you? She said, this is a big opportunity. You should take it. 
So it was my mother who basically gave me that big prod right at the end. My husband, of course, and my former dean at the University of Wollongong, who was a referee for me as I moved across. And the moral of the story here is I didn't feel different. Okay, I knew I was different. We're all different. We're all unique. We all should acknowledge that. But how? Sometimes when we're in an environment, difference doesn't speak to us very clearly. So in America, I was a migrant. I was, you know, I needed a visa to work there. I still do. I don't have a green card. I'm applying for one. And I'm not a permanent resident. And I'm not a citizen. But that question, who of you in this room are first in family to graduate? I didn't understand what first in family meant. And he didn't mean if I was the first person of the children of my family to go to university because my older brother was the first one of the four to go to university. But he meant whose parents were not degree um, certified or qualified. And of course, my parents were both shepherds uh, in Greece. They raised uh, animals and grew crops. And of course, my father in particular, who's much older than my mum, uh, lived through World War II, also was orphaned during World War II. So it is very interesting that I didn't raise my hand. And when I realised, as people started to discuss with President Crow what that meant, I slumped back in my chair and thought, oh my goodness, I'm one of these people. But my parents had never indoctrinated me like that it wasn't about you know you should feel so lucky because you've got an education it was more of course you're going to go to university of course you're going to study and who knows what you'll become um i always felt lucky in my household uh, though we only had, were on one salary my father's salary a factory worker and my mother later on part-time as a cleaner i understood the value of hard work and so i had wonderful role models Today's talk dovetails on that. If I went through every one of the participants online tonight, and I'd like from you, tell me something that's unique about you. And you don't have to speak. This session is being recorded, and my hope is to uh, upload it publicly. But if you don't have to say your name, but if you're willing to unmute and, and speak, tell me something that's unique about you. Or you can write something in the chat, which won't be in public view, and I can dovetail from that. Let me jump in and start them off. Not many people know, or well, they know now that I go to a village and I work in a village, but I was actually raised in a village in New South Wales, in Bathurst, outside of Bathurst. It was called Eglinton and Eglinton was referred to as a village. But I never realised that it takes a village until I went to an Indian village to understand exactly what that term meant. Um, and the other thing I often tell students when an icebreaker type thing, they eventually know that I am a qualified pilot, but I had to give that up for certain reasons. And I'm one of about 5%, I think, in the world who've seen ball lightning. So you may have to Wikipedia or Google ball lightning, but I did have that big basketball size glowing ball pass in front of me between the walls and go out and in a, in a very violent storm about 15 years ago. So a couple of things people know about. So Jason, do you think for us to recognize unique things, we have to have lived them ourselves? Or in your case, it was only when you traveled as an adult to what you considered a real village that you recognized that your place was a village? 
Yeah, I think we don't recognize the uniqueness about us, about what we experience. I think I you're certainly, right. I certainly hadn't been to a, another type of village unless it was another, you know, country type village, like a hamlet, if we were over in the UK or in France or some, something like that. You know, places like Karkor or you know, these really small little enclaves of rural people. Um, so there could be hundreds of unique things about us, but understanding what they are probably doesn't come until much later in life. So we've, we've got um, somebody who likes ball lightning and we also got a, another comment. I don't know. Uh, we've got a, a representative here of First Nations heritage a few generations back and parents were publicans and always taught to be happy and help those around us, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, of that student uh, who contributed just a moment ago, um, are you like that by nature as a result of that lived experience? Yes, the response is I believe so in the chat. And so what we've got here is an example of a lived experience. We've got two examples. Uh, Dr. Sargent has told us about growing up in a village, a community, but recognizing this specialness only once he ventured overseas and witnessed firsthand a conception of a village and then realized uh, he had been brought up in one. And the second example is of Again, the importance of place and country, a recognition of heritage, particularly First Nations heritage. Even though it was a few generations back and as publicans to have that attitude, that happy go lucky attitude, which remains with us. So it's a lived experience. It's encapsulated in a nucleus. Um, and uh, that individual has noted, I still check with my parents like yourself when making major life decisions and the response is always as long as you're happy. And if I can share something with this student, uh, whenever uh, I've had to make some big decisions and they impact my family, my immediate family, my husband, for example, and my kids, my husband's phrase is, I'll always support you. How empowering. So my mother is like, don't tell me I can't, you can. And then I've got my husband going, I'll support you, whatever you do. Um, another student reflects, I don't think anything I have done is unique by itself as others have gone through the same. My collection of experiences is perhaps unique though. Very, very interesting comment. Um, so I agree uh, with this student. For example, there'd be many second generation Greek Australians who have found themselves going through similar experiences. And by the way, some of them may not have liked those experiences at all, particularly depending on when racial slurs would have been used against them, particularly in the 60s and 70s. Um, interestingly enough, when I found myself in America uh, and I had to fill out a lot of um, self-identifying forms, uh, it, there was nothing there saying I was either, you know, the question was, are you white? And a lot of my colleagues assumed I had never been a victim of racism. Fascinating, I thought. So you're white, you know, it doesn't count um, if you've been a victim of racism. And uh, what counts in America, for example, is the complex debate uh, of, for example, black versus white, um, Native Americans and so forth, uh, Latino, Hispanic of origin and even what we're saying here in this particular point is that the collection of experiences is unique. Your journey is unique. And perhaps others can empathize with what you've been through. And that's really important in public interest technology. This is a wonderful point because one of the blessings of the internet has been that we can find people who have had a similar journey, but not an exact one but also that have had the similar lived experience. 
and people can congregate to, together. This is what actually is called a community of practice. And the internet has enabled these amazing communities of practice. Now, on this last point, I want you to think about public interest tech in two ways. The first one is as a professional. You're going to soon graduate and you're going to be in a position of empowerment once employed. What lens do you use in order to develop or design systems? What are the embedded values that you will build with? How will you interact with the end users in order to consult with them about your practice and their practices? What are those communal things that you can build things around? For example, I could postulate for a moment that everything I design um, should be unique. For example, Katina likes her features on her mobile phone in a certain way. So I should ask her and Katina will have a different phone to the next student, to the next professor, to the person on the street. Or I can say, let's look at this community. They want to develop some kind of process or technological artifact. And let's look at their lived experience and listen to them about what their needs are. And public interest tech is not really about building shiny gadgetry. It's about asking communities of practice that are forming. And before they form, they're just communities. When I say just, I'd rather stress the word communities than just. But they're like those groups that we each grew up in. Perhaps the one that recognizes our Aboriginal heritage. Another, for example, that recognizes ethnicity. And yet another one that recognizes disability, for example. And so when we're building public interest technology, we stress the public interest. And you can only know the public interest if as a designer, you are side by side with the end user. Sometimes this is called a co-design approach where you acknowledge you're building a socio-technical system. And I believe you've covered that earlier in the session. But when there's interaction between different subsystems like society, technological processes, and then environmental slash physical conditions and legislation and regulations and laws, for instance, then this interaction becomes a socio-technical system. But when I build for that socio-technical system, I might be using a particular approach, like a participatory approach or a co-design approach. And if we stress the co-design for a moment, particularly cognizant that we're talking about the public interest, we don't want to be like those politicians decades ago in the US that said the public interest is this, and we're going to determine what it is for the people and we'll build them whatever they need but it's to consult with them it's to stand shoulder to shoulder like you do in these ritual ceremonies uh being up or sitting down you are co-designing you're almost holding the hand of the participant the community that you are a part of and if you seek permission for example in aboriginal communities or in village communities like dr sergeant has in remote villages in india then you can be brought into the community with special privileges. But trust has to be imbued in that process. Otherwise, you won't be brought in. You won't be accepted. Your presence won't be dignified. Your respect won't be there. But the minute you are co, you are standing shoulder to shoulder with someone in the community, you are with that community. And what you are trying to do is to use the uniqueness of the community and your own uniqueness as a designer to say, I want to learn, share with me. I want to live like you live. I want to live in the community in Bathurst. I want to live in that Greek Australian ethnic community. I want to live with all uh, respect, side by side, to understand better the heritage of the Aboriginal person that I'm working with. This takes time and it takes budget. It's not a cheap approach to the Facebook sort of motto, 
move fast and break things. It's not a cheap approach to the Nike motto, just do it. These are almost abhorrent to today's sustainability practices. And when I'm talking sustainability, I'm not just talking about the environment. I'm talking about social sustainability. Because if we move fast and break things and just do it, we're going to end up in a mess. We've got big goals in the UN Sustainable Development Goals to meet. And we're not going to meet them if we don't meet each other at a point of union, at a point where I can have dialogue with you, at a point that says I want to listen to you. I want you to tell me your story because I care about you. I want you to share with me what is unique about you. I don't want to make assumptions. I don't want to build an AI that is agnostic and just uses training data to determine who you are. And because you're black, I'll put you behind bars. I want to build with the notion that one in five people will suffer a depressive episode. It, that number is raise, rising quickly. One in seven women between the ages of 18 and 25 suffer from PTSD in the UK. One in seven, but they've never been to war. They've never been victims of shell shock like in World War I. So if we don't empathize with where people are at, increasingly, we're going to be building redundant technologies and redundant gadgetry that just will reaffirm the injustices. If I build for the masses, it may work for critical infrastructure because all of us need to drink water, but it's not going to work for apps. It's not going to work for learning processes. It's not going to work for democracy. It's not going to work for all of these vital other systems. And they're all interdependent. And we're dealing with complexity. I know this is a underlying issue in this lecture today that with all of these complex systems and the highly interdependent processes in place is a ripple effect when something doesn't work or goes down. And I'll explain it like this. I used to work in critical infrastructure a lot. Water powers electricity. Electricity powers telecommunications. Telecommunications powers banking. And banking powers the online internet world. Transactions in retail stores. If any one of these flows comes down, is interrupted, then the whole thing falls apart. I can't take money out from my ATM machine. I can't buy stuff at the local store. And that's when we call these dilemmas. You know, what's worse? Not having electricity or not being able to bank or uh, not being able to use my mobile phone service. And we think often, oh, we're always going to have mobile phones. We're always going to have the internet. We're always going to have electricity. But the critical infrastructure, most of the times, these SCADA systems, these systems that we build around critical infrastructure are teetering on a, <laughs> on a hair. And we see this when grids go down. And when grids go down, there's massive outages and there's massive interruptions to flows. But going back to communities for a moment, as a designer, your whole function will be to listen and to do that requirements part of the systems development life cycle to spend the majority of the time there in the problem space what is the problem how do i align myself with the stakeholders how do i get the stakeholders to come to the table and talk with one another that's the, going to be the challenge and from the other side it's when you will be not in the corporate setting, but as a citizen using your 
professional expertise and lived experience to respond to things. And this is where we start talking about volunteerism and engineering and volunteerism. So like we have uh, doctors without borders, we also have engineers without borders or technologists without borders. Having the sensitivity and the empathic intelligence to know where our limits are, to know how we can use our craft. I remember, uh, it may not have been Dr. Sargent's class, but a few years after, uh, I used to like showing small snippets of video. And back then I'd carry in VHS cassettes because every lecture theater had a video player, not DVD, right? Back then, 20 years ago. And at home, I would prepare carefully to time it to a place, a segment of a video of a film, which would impart something. And once on a plane, I was teaching in Singapore for the University of Wollongong, I saw the movie Pay It Forward. And I came back to the university and I chose a scene from that video, that film. And there's a scene where the teacher is talking to a fourth grade class. And it's a very powerful scene. And three words, pay it forward. And Dr. Sargent and I always talk about this. But he presents a problem for that whole year to his class. This is the teacher in the classroom, to a fourth grade class. He says, I want you to think about how you're going to change the world. And here are these little kids, you know, looking up at their teacher thinking, you know, I'm just like nine years old. What do you mean I'm going to change the world or ten? And their, their minds are ticking. Of course, all of this is staged. But if I pose the same question to you, can you share with me online now through chat? Or if you wanted to unmute, what would you change? If I said to you, money was not an issue, you had a roof over your head, we weren't, ch ch you know, uh, uh, hoping for those six-figure salaries, we didn't want to get rich quick, and I said to you, you had money, you had food, it was modest, but you were living, and you desperately wanted to contribute something through your professional expertise and lived experience, these two things together, that union in the center, what would it be? What would you do if you could tomorrow not have to think about money? What would you do with your skills? Have you thought about that? I'll give you a moment to, to respond. And maybe, Jason, we can stop screen sharing. So what would you do? So not see the slides, Kat, that's what you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The students can have the slides, of course. Yeah. I was just going to pop up. Um, Please, anything. I'll do it. I can't multitask. <laughs> one thing at a time. Okay. Um, okay, stop that one. There you are. Let me just find a slide which is beautifully what um, you're talking about now. So if you could change the world for the better, here we are. We've got a few coming through. Okay. To this student, if I was smart enough, I'd want to eliminate fake news. Guess what? You are smart enough because you've identified a problem. So close family have fallen down the QAnon rabbit hole and can't stand it, says the individual. Okay, let's think about this. One of the ways you could do that, could we create new platforms? And I don't want you to think what exists today, but what might exist and how that could be powered. Another student says, pass my skills on to as many people as possible and get better at what I can do, improve myself to improve my community. Wow, exactly. 
that's what co-design is. It's seeking to grow together. I mean, these are fundamental values that we see, we think they're not relevant anymore because of the, how the world currently works. But pass my skills on to as many people as possible. Okay, Dr. Sargent, where have you done that? So you can see this slide. I put it up in semester one's workshop and asked the students, same sort of big picture idea, mm. the upgrade your yes. world sort of idea, right? And then good students being good students said to me, all right, now what would you do? And I said, okay, um, challenge accepted here. I would somehow make it possible for you to come along with me into these village type situations. And I would stand back because you've got your technical skills. I don't need to be in there holding the computer with you, having that conversation with all those family members I've now got over in those tribal villages. It would be you surrounded by little kids, the grown-ups, you'd be in your element, and I'd be standing back just stroking my chin thinking, this is it. The ethos is for the students to go further than you. I think that's the job of the teacher. Yes. And so if I could somehow get everybody across up into regional Victoria, not over into India, just wherever, but into the field, away from the desk, holding that hand with that individual, that's what I would do. I would, I would work to be able to do that. That's beautiful because um, President Crow basically gave us a similar directive. If I see you behind the computer at your desk 24 seven with your door closed, you're doing the wrong thing. We, we, we're not supposed to cut code remotely, never see people, upload it, not even see its effects and then do it again the next day. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be in there. And I want you to think about your current communities of practice and your current communities. What do they look like? Why are you part of them? What attracts you to them? What might you do together? And I also don't want you to think about that doing part as being a shiny gadget. It may well be a business process, a, a socio-technical process that you introduce that does something magnanimous. One of our students said online, I would like to use technology to help people safe, feel safe in their daily lives. Wow, I have a wonderful student uh, in my public interest technology program at the at Arizona State University, who also works for the national uh, violence, a national violence NGO and she looks at gender-based violence. And some of her work, one of the reasons she came into the PIT master's program was to be able to think about how she could make men and women and those that self-identify as other uh, safe in their daily lives. Is it a panic button in the house? Is it a GPS that is uh, with you? Uh, is it a device that's simple? that could uh, create like a concierge service to get help from a carer? Uh, are you someone who is perhaps at the early onset stages of dementia and may wander, but don't have the cognitive ability to know when you've wandered outside your sort of boundary zones, you know, to the nearest shopping center, to the nearest station or so forth. Um, this is a big thing. This is a huge research area. Um, on American campuses, a lot of the young women between the ages of 18 and 23 uh, have been victims of rape and increasingly men as well. Uh, there are new kinds of devices that are being deployed on American campuses because of what's called the Cleary Act, so that sensor-based polls can determine the nearest uh, handsets and um, 
people who request emergency support and help. A lot of campuses have their own campus police, for example. Uh, often there are alerts deployed when someone has been a victim and they're trying to find somebody um, quickly. Now, I, want, I don't want you to think about a campus, you know, of a thousand people. I want you to think about a campus of 50,000 people. Um, and then an open sort of campus. Our Australian campuses are quite closed in comparison to some of the ones internationally. So I agree. How can technology be used to help people feel safe in their daily lives? This particular student I'm talking to you about is presenting uh, with Dr. Sargent uh, in a few weeks at an international forum for the American Association of Geographers, looking in Jason's case of humanitarian issues and geographic information systems, and in Toby's case, how technology as a dual use uh, device can both help and also not help victims. For example, if you're at home and you're a victim of domestic violence and your partner is shoulder surfing at your web page or after you've gone to sleep, goes and looks at historical records of sites you visited and you're not aware of those things, um, there are now new technological workarounds for such things. Uh, Toby has helped create one of these applications that is UK based. So the ability for either your screen to go to another screen when someone is shoulder surfing behind or the history to be scrubbed or fake histories to come up when someone is searching uh, your private settings. Another um, student wrote, I would like to develop a cultural outreach history app game gamified learning that can help bridge the gap in knowledge about the first nations and i think that's fantastic um, there's so many um, angles in that one a lot of my students in the public interest technology degree love role playing and gaming many of them are gamers themselves but their gaming um, experience helps them to understand how they may be able to build games that may help people orient better towards each other. So rather than the shoot 'em up games that I was brought up on, and probably Jason was uh, when I was probably 12 years of age, these games are games that develop awareness and they do it in stages. Often bringing someone along your journey can't happen overnight. It's very rare to meet someone and to go from the beginning of your journey right to the end in like one night's conversation. As trust is built up, as we recognize the behavior of the other person towards us and we can ascertain that trust, but also as it becomes more uh, comfortable and uh, more meaningful over a relationship, um, we may share more. Uh, and this is one of the things builders of technology often don't think about building relationships with others. They don't think about outreach. They don't think about the end user as a collaborator, as the person or the individual they are empowering. But something amazing happens again when you stand or sit shoulder to shoulder with, it, with your neighbor. And that is you've recognized the richness of their personhood, learning a language, learning about their history, learning about their fears and their victories. All of these things give us something so special that you want to be alive the next day to learn more. Um, that's friendship. Our communities are friendship groups that are brought together by something that is meaningful. But if we did that in our practice as designers, you might say to me, but Katina, if I work for one of the big four consulting companies, any of this is not gonna fly. And I'm gonna say to you, yes, it will, because that's where they're headed. If companies do not transform in this awareness of the other, then we are just 
othering people. So if we don't go around, around living what I'm talking to you about, this notion of care, I care about you so much, I want to learn about you. Because if I know more about you, I can help build something with you. You'll tell me, I'll tell you. And that exchange may make us each individually richer and collectively stronger. But when I leave after my engagement, because my contract ends or the runs out, or because it was just a six month engagement sponsored by an international organization, I'm not just leaving you without empowering you. I'm doing what one of the students says above, and I repeat, I'm passing my skills on to as many people as possible. Who will do what? They will pay it forward. They will pass it on again. And skills don't require us to always go to university. It's wonderful if you can afford that. But to be honest, so many people, for example, in the US couldn't even harbor the idea of going to university. They're lucky if they can go to college. And college, even though the community colleges teach very similar in the first two years to the universities, the price differential of and the cost differential of going to college versus the university is marked. It's something like 50% cheaper to go to college than it is to go to university for the first two years which are pretty much identical but a lot of people can't even afford college a lot of people can't even afford to stay to the end of school um recently i had a former phd student graduate who didn't finish high school but he went back to tafe after dropping out of high school in year 10 and he took the long journey, but he doesn't even have an HSC. <laughs> he finally got into university through a pathway, a community college, then his bachelor's degree, then his master's, then his PhD. Now he's a doctor. What a journey. But reaching out to empower others with our skills. In a way to conclude, I want to ask you now, do you have any questions of one another or of me or of Jason today? Katina, just to maybe frame this, so there's a little bit of detail in the weekly module on Canvas um, about PIT, um, New America, for example. Um, I may have mentioned Stanford's PIT Lab, those type of things, just probably one or two web pages long, not too much detail. There's links to your website. Um, so lots and lots of details, lots of videos there that students could look through. Um, but I'm pretty sure that after you bringing us back to that sort of human-centered, the humanity part of public interest technology, students and I can quickly see that it's doesn't matter what role we go into, it doesn't matter what type of organisation, it's it's an attitude, it's a way of thinking rather than um, you know it's it's not a framework, it's it's an attitude I think. To have that holding that hand of the user as you're building, keeping in mind that you will be the user of the system. It's mm -hmm. uh, round and round, generational. And I think um, we can talk a little bit about that question you posed right at the beginning. You know, uh, friends, Dr. Sargent is working in technology for social impact. And his research group that he co-directs is, is on this notion. When Jason was doing his honours thesis at the University of Wollongong, he had a word in there, a term, digital transformation. This is long before the World Economic Forum said it was a thing. 
And if I was to say to you, what has our group done at large? And there's many of us working together all over the world with great respect for each other. We love the people we work with. If we have co-authored together uh, and we've researched together on different projects over the last 20 years is because we love each other. And not many people love each other in the workforce. You know, what are you going to produce, friends, if you hate the person that's sitting next to you? What, what will you produce of value if there's no communication between the people you're supposed to be building with? And so I reckon we sort of were doing public interest technology 20 years ago because we recognised that it wasn't about technology, it was about people. Socio-technical systems are about humans. What a shock. They're not about build fast and break things and fly to the moon because everyone that's working for you is making a modest salary that, that and they can't afford even to pay their energy bills. Yeah, looks nice in the media, you know. It's a great story, like he went to the moon, richest guy on earth. Big whoops. Most people can't afford to eat a meal. Where's the news about that? And going back to the person who said she doesn't want to see disinformation out there and fake news, she's had enough. Well, to be honest, some of these big corporations are teetering on fake news. It's not fake. He went to the moon. But what I mean is, who cares? You know what I would have loved to read? Magnate of Big Corp feeds Central Africa, the Central Republic of Africa, for a year with money he could have spent going to the moon. Whoa, that's a story. You might think, but Katina, um, we don't have the capacity. We don't have the power that that guy has. And I'm going to say to you, of course you do. It goes back, one of the students raised in the chat who said my parents always wanted me to have a happy go lucky attitude. attitude or um you know that i can't rhetoric wasn't in our vocabulary change happens one person at a time change happens in communities so all change is local friends and it's scalable that change is scalable, but all change is local. So when you have a moment of doubt about your place in the world, I want you to write down all the people you impact and all the people you meet every day when you wake up in the morning, from the minute you wake up to the moment you put your head on a, on a pillow. And if you're dissatisfied with the connections you have, change them or broaden them. There's a question here um, from one of the students. Do you see more of a challenge in collaboration due to political views these days? There seems to be a greater divide between left and right now, and I wonder how that affects technological progress. I agree with you. Um, technology has become a divisive issue. Um, in the US, the polarization based on politics has been a huge area of research over the last three years in particular. I always can get out of it when I'm there because I say I'm not American, so I don't really uh, talk about politics. But socio-technical systems are heavily political. Politics is everywhere. Technology is about politics. It's about power. The way we use technology today is about power. It's about politics. And navigating this divide is tricky. Because often you're building for half the community and the other half may say, but technology sucks. Now, when you're building for community groups, often those communities that are bound by place are physical space and you're in situ don't have that marked difference in politics. 
I'm not talking about war-torn areas where there's a lot of conflict and division. It's all political. Even introducing um, a way to vote independently is heavily politicized. The actual process, and I know many of your Swinburne University of Technology professors and uh, faculty academics have been working in this area of voting, identification, security in parts of Africa. So technology can liberate and it can also suffocate. And this is a really critical question here. When you think you're doing good by introducing a new technology, but that technology ends up backfiring, causing mass discrimination or being used down the track for an unintended purpose, a retrospective purpose where scope creep has been introduced and the data that was once collected for good is used for harm. Every tech has a double-edged sword and there are at least two political parties, um, if not more. And so when you're designing, the question is, who are you designing for? And how can we introduce open democratic systems that are less polarizing? It seems to catch on internationally. Uh, but we can just look at, for example, challenges in China, in the southern Thai provinces, where there has been discrimination against Muslim minorities and how repatriation has occurred, if not sort of brainwashing through the taking away of technology and your rights. I want you to think for a second, if someone came to your house and said to you, I'm sorry, you can't use your telephone anymore, or you're coming with me, we're going to re-educate you in a camp because your political views are wrong. And so then technology becomes a tool of oppression as opposed to a tool for freedom. So it depends who has the power. And the more we empower more people, the more that empowerment is equalized between communities. And communities of practice form, COP, communities of practice. On that point, I think, um, Jason, uh, I've said too much and I'll hand back to you. No, no, thank you. I was just going to maybe ask you one more question. How do you know that it's working? How is this? What's the success? Success is the wrong word, but, you know, you look at Pitt and you go, good, that, that's what it should be doing. Because I was challenged today about the measurement of social impact. And I said, yes. I don't have a measurement of it, right? But I look into the eyes of that village member or an elder or somebody in the classroom, whether it's in India or Pakistan or wherever it is. And I know straight away that I've had my project team or the co-design of what we're trying to do together, it's worked just by looking them in the eyeballs. But they don't give me a, a scale out of 10, you know, or write me a reference letter to say this is the quantitative impact. So if we're going to move along all together into pit, what are the sort of indicators that we're getting it right? What a question to end with, friends, because it's a real question. Annually, for the last three years, uh, ASU have held what's called a social embeddedness conference. And I direct the what was once called, I was hired to run this centre called the Engineering Policy Society Group Center. And my colleagues in the center said to me, there's something wrong with that paradigm. It took us a year to change our name from Engineering Policy and Society to Society Policy and Engineering. <laughs> society comes first, it doesn't come last. Society is not a consequence of engineering. And my team work in different domains, social and environmental injustice, um, using technology for civic purposes, like um, advocating against helium extraction, for example, 
by mining companies. Um, we've got somebody looking at care and the role of care in engineering practice, particularly synthetic biology labs. Um, we've got people looking at disability and advocating for disability rights, women's empowerment, excuse me, and all of these different things. How do you know it's working? I mean, this was exactly the conference call in the social embeddedness where they were asking us what metrics do we use? I mean, metrics, do you quantify what I'm talking to you about? And I'm going to say we're going to be increasingly challenged to quantify that I agree with Jason. If people want you back again and again, that's a, that's a, you know, you've stayed friends for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. That to me is enough of a metric. It's qualitative, however. It's not going to prove in a return on investment where people will say, here, I'm giving you another million dollars. Go into the community again. Be there. Empower them. And of course, we've got IEEE working with the humanitarian um, challenges group humanitarian community challenges group where they do give out these bursaries and this money on small projects and it's the humanitarian technology challenge is very complex because you do want to for example put up a base station that will give somebody the ability to use a telephone somewhere but at the same time if you leave and never revisit again and that base station falls into disrepair or has a problem or there's been a tornado gone, gone through or something has happened. No one knows how to bring it back up. Well, it's a waste of $100,000 of a, of, a, of a tower. So we know one of the measures of success is that you remain in close contact over time. And that's a, one of the obvious things. But I'm going to say we have to quantify in some way. Some people say, oh, that's easy. I can quantify and monitor how often people use a service. I could go like uh, Jason did into a community in the Karen group on the Thai Burma border and ethnographically study what is the phenomenon, what's going on, and interview people. I can monitor usage statistics if I have the consent of the people. I can look at um, the transactions and free flow of information and money that has occurred as a result of that interaction. I could look at the educational awareness and I can measure things with surveys, but all that takes money and time and resources. So often our heart's in the right place, but I want everyone to be reminded again, the changes we make one-on-one -on -one to each other, they're the changes that, are, uh, uh, that count. And while we have to get better at providing metrics, this is particularly the case with non-government organizations and not-for-profits. You know, what's the not-for-profit going to say? Oh, my donations increased by 10%. We're doing a good job, so people are giving us more money. That's one metric. Or the non-government organization is saying, oh, look, we, we got donations and we gave out 10 grants this year, and those 10 grants um, impacted 20 communities. Or um, on this project, 30 volunteers came on board instead of like 15 from last year. Or we deployed small teams into these three countries. We didn't do that last year. It's always benchmarking. And I think while we're so avidly trying to make change, it's very hard to capture metrics because often you're too busy doing than measuring. You know, there are a lot of academics out there that constantly are measuring their impact based on citation counts. Friends, is that the correct way to measure an academic's impact in the world? So if I was President Crow, he said, stop writing, inverted commas, go out there and do, be part of the community, build with cognizance, innovate at the precipice and the coal phase. He's not going to measure us on the number of citations. He's going to measure us on patents. 
is going to measure us on other metrics that are more about um, the charter of the university, which is very much about the creativity and entrepreneurial mindset, but also about humans, about people. And these models may be challenged at different times, right? Especially during times of economic downturn, like we're living in at the moment with the pandemic. It may well be you're more hireable, for example, if your citation count is high as an academic in certain universities. And proving in what Jason and I are talking about is really complex. So at a time where cash is not as available and grants are hard to come by, me writing a grant on public interest technology or me seeking employment in the public interest technology sector, and let's call it a sector for a second, is not going to fetch me the same amount of money as if I work for Facebook, unless the fundamental business model changes. And that's an editorial that I hope Jason can share with you uh, in September, even though your class will be finished likely by then. But we've just finished an editorial, we've written together for a special issue, where we're talking about the public interest and the need to change these models, the need to change planned obsolescence, to dump things after you know, six months and they don't work on purpose. We need sustainable solutions. We don't want throwaway solutions. We need to change the business model that says empower the community, pay people to get out there. You know, once I was, I was invited to talk to the New South Wales government and it was about New South Wales health initiatives and how AI would support this. And to the shock and horror of the organisers, I get up and I say, you know, someone says from the audience, now tell us, Professor Michael, what do we need? And I said, we need more people. We need AI, but we need more people to act on the aid and decision-making tool of the AI, which is telling us about health issues in our communities. I said, we need more people. We need a greater budget, not less. We need more humans knocking on the door to help people living with diabetes, to help people who are single, uh, alone, elderly, and living with a cognitive uh, condition. We need more help for the people who are disabled. Look at what the NDIS has done for so many people, both on the employment side and the disability side. So rather than needing less people, I stress we need more people and technology becomes a process by which to aid our decision making and aid our awareness of where people are in need. And then we can define what. But that's a long-winded answer to your question, Jason, but I, I thank you for asking it. Well, as you said, wouldn't it be good if Bezos chipped in a couple of, a bit of coinage to, to allow us to do that? Thank you, Katina, as always, um, a blessing that we'll unpack for weeks and weeks to come, I'm sure. Um, everybody listening in and who's with us, remember you've got Katina's uh, website, details in the module, we'll make available, you'll have the recording of this, but you'll see the slides, the 30, 38 that we didn't get to from Katina's <laughs> slide deck. Um, but I would sit and listen as I have for many years, um, and I called you Katina, my BFG, the big friendly giant, and I said, reach out. Um, it'd be like a big hug and you're somebody we want on our side. So there may be a couple of LinkedIn um, is happening in the future. That. Yeah. We'd love that. You're all welcome. Well, thank, thank you very, very much. Um, we've kept you over time, but well worth it. Thank you, friends. Thank you so much Any for sharing. Last, that's our pleasure. Any last things before we call it a night? And I'll see you online next week. No worries. Thanks, everybody. And if you are still in those tightening lockdowns, we've already had one conversation out of um, in overtime, let's call it. Reach out to me. Um, I've been there, done that, lived it. So if you're in Sydney particularly and things are just a bit too much Groundhog day -ish, reach out to me and this will make more sense in about two weeks' time when we get into mental health. Keep well, everybody. Um, thanks for dropping in for this evening. Thank you, Katina, again.